Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have my speech prepared here, but I wanted to ask the audience's permission uh, if I could start with just a couple of minutes of a rant. Thank you very much. Uh, I have some concerns. Uh, one of the things I want to say that I'm really grateful for the diversity, not only of this audience, but of the speakers of this conference. I think we're an example to the world of what diversity is supposed to be, what it actually is, different ways of thinking, different ways of approaching life. But I was left with a concern, and it's for the women in this audience. I feel you have been burdened with the responsibility for my moral character and for having a civilizing effect on me. I, I want you to know that you are all absolved of that responsibility as of now. Such a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I have managed, I have managed a 14-year relationship with a woman and have maintained fidelity in that relationship without being threatened a single time because of my values. And one more item that I just have to rant about, and please cover the ears of your children. There are 17 items on this list in front of you. It could be 70. It could be 700. There are so many issues facing men and boys today that we can scarcely count them. I want to say without equivocation that until I wake up in a culture where this is not looked at and shrugged, where it's not looked at and laughed at, where it's not looked at and have people tell me that I hate women in order to express compassion for these problems, then I do not want to hear fuck all about how men need to be returned to their responsibilities to women. That feels so much better. <laughs> now I can start my talk. Hi, everyone. Let me take a moment first to offer some thanks to some people who genuinely deserve it. To Mike Buchanan and the People for Justice and Men and Boys for doing such a fantastic job of putting on a conference of this scale. to all the wonderful speakers here. Also, there's a list of people at AVFM and elsewhere who deserve recognition and thanks. Aaron Pitsy, David King, Peter Wright, Dean Esme, Janet Bloomfield, Robert Brockway, August Lowenschulz and the AVFM editorial team, Janice Fiamingo, Steve Brule, Brian Scandrett and the AVFM Facebook team, Hannah Wallen, Karen Strawn, Allison Tiemann, Al Martin, Jack Barnes, Dan Perrins, Pierce Harlan, Warren Farrell, Robert Franklin, Sage Gerard, Lucian Balsan, Suzanne McCarley, Aldir Grisindo, Daniel Martinez, Angry Harry, whom we miss dearly. And the same for Earl Silverman. My apologies to the people that I have neglected to mention. There are scores of you. Also, a thank you to my partner, Stacy, who has remained my best friend through one heck of a ride. Yeah. Eight years ago, A Voice for Men was founded with the intent of forcing a discussion about the issues faced by men and boys. 
At the time, we were one of an isolated, small, and scattered collection of people dedicated to that cause. Since then, the world has changed. That discussion has begun. A significant challenge to feminism is expanding through the cultural narrative, and much more importantly, within that challenge lies the potential to actually make some badly needed changes for men and boys. The problems and possible solutions have been spoken to here, and the challenge to feminism has been amplified by some very exceptional speakers. I really don't think there's much that I can add to what they've already said. As the last speaker here, I do want to add something else to this growing discussion, knowing that the important work of anti-feminism will continue. In doing this talk, I do, oh, I repeated myself. In doing this talk, I'm going to make some declarations, which is to say I'm going to express my opinions, particularly about why, despite the growing intensity of men's activism, so little has actually changed. To be honest with you, I don't think we really will see real progress until we have a more complete understanding of a couple of things. One, men have a lot more problems than just feminism. And two, feminism, as destructive and morally bankrupt as it is, is just another symptom of a larger problem that's been around for a long, long time. That problem is called gynocentrism, and it is not only the reason something as insane as feminism has managed to flourish, it is the taproot of a range of problems that have nothing at all to do with gender politics. Gynocentrism is at once one of the biggest problems faced by men and the reason we have such a hard time talking about it. Gynocentrism is why feminism, which arguably started as a sexual revolution, quickly became a social carcinogen and a hate movement. It is why women have advanced so far on equal rights and why they have gone in the exact opposite direction where it concerns the accompanying responsibilities. It is... <clears throat> Excuse me. It is why our family law system was an unjust mess before women could even vote, and it is why it has only worsened in the age of feminism. Gynocentrism is why our boys are under attack in our schools and why we don't defend them. And it is why we did this long before BAWA, before the feminist agenda to turn dysfunctional, pain-ridden families in, into a lucrative industry. Gynocentrism made feminism a corrupt establishment cash cow and drove the entire industrialized world to remain silent while it happened. In case you didn't notice, when you scan the modern sexual landscape, you will find what Alison Tiemann has called the empathy apartheid a cruel and unjust disparity of compassion between men and women. We may be committing a fatal error to write that unholy divide off to feminism alone, and a society that fails to have an honest discussion about that will be perpetually a society that fails to address any of the concerns that brought us here together for this conference. I dare say that a men's rights narrative that contains itself to the evils of feminism while gratifying may well also serve to keep us from getting to the heart of why we're here. So, gentlemen, ladies, we need to talk. Not just to the world, but to each other. And we have to do so knowing that even in this room, the conversation is challenging and difficult. It is not easy for men to look directly at women and insist, however lovingly, that they step down from the pedestal, to tell them that we embrace their equality but not their privilege, and to tell them that they are valued, but no more valued than their brothers, fathers, and husbands. It's not easy for women to look directly at men and insist that they dismount from their white horses to tell them that treating women 
with anything less than absolute agency and autonomy is not only insulting, it is the prevailing form of misogyny. That is tough talk, but without it, we're bound to follow the path of a Mobius strip, settling for the illusion of progress for both sexes while we go in circles. To avoid that, one thing we have to come to terms with is gynocentrism. So what exactly is gynocentrism? We see it most prominently expressed in biology, chivalry, and romantic love. Let's take a brief look at each one. The biology is pretty simple. It makes perfect sense that human beings evolved with a premium on the lives of women. After all, it only takes one man to impregnate almost a limitless amount of women with comparatively little investment of time and energy. So in that light, a degree of gynocentrism would not only be healthy, but vital to human survival. Women have a significant investment in human reproduction. Common sense tells you that you could wipe out most of the men in any particular society of human beings and they, re could, they could repopulate in a relatively short order. Wipe out most of the women, though, and you have a completely different set of problems, problems that could imperil the species. It stands to reason, then, that in six million years of hominid evolution, that part of our survival is owed to prioritizing women over men in a variety of ways. The drive in men to protect and provide for women, which most of us regard as instinctive, would appear to be an artifact of that evolution. Another component of the biology is a drive in men for reproduction. It's almost indescribably powerful. It also evokes the best and worst that men can be. However, despite the feminist revision of human history, our shared past does not reflect the culture of men who simply dominated women physically in order to reproduce. All the evidence points to the idea that in order to reproduce, men have to be selected by female sexual partners. In this process, men compete with each other, sometimes betraying their self-interest, their friendships, and every moral principle they hold. In modern times, we certainly have it dressed up to look and feel more civilized, but it does not change the heart of things any more than ordering a steak in a nice restaurant changes the killing that goes on behind the scenes. That is the biological one-two punch, the synergistic combination of men's protective instinct and reproductive strategy. When you look objectively, it becomes nearly impossible to miss the connection between biology and the potential for exaggerated gynocentrism. And it becomes apparent how men can have all the outward appearances of power, even as they are used and exploited by their drive to protect and provide for women. Does anyone really believe that feminism is the cause of this? Or does feminism, with the help of corrupt women and male quizlings, simply take advantage of what's already there? Well, E. Belford Bax gave us some pretty darn astute observations about this over a hundred years ago in his book, The Fraud of Feminism. I'm quoting here from chapter five, The Chivalry Fake, from that prescient book. But these considerations afford only one more illustration of the utter irrationality of the whole movement of sentimental feminism identified with the notion of chivalry. For the rest, we may find illustrations of this galore. A very flagrant case is that infamous rule of the sea, which came so much into prominence at the time of the Titanic disaster. And keep in mind, this was written a year after the Titanic sank. According to this preposterous, preposterous chivalric feminism, in the case of a ship foundering, it is the unwritten law of the seas, not that the passengers shall leave the ship and be rescued in the order as they come, but that the whole female portions shall have the right of being rescued 
before any man is allowed to leave the ship. Now this abominable piece of sex favoritism on the face of it cries aloud in its irrational injustice, unquote. Bax also understood how all this translated into the day-to-day -day lives of men and women. He also wrote, and I quote again, it's a cheap thing, for example, in the case of a man and a woman quarreling in the street to play out the stage role of the bold and gallant Englishman, the man who won't see a woman maltreated and put upon, not he. And this, of course, without any inquiry into the merits of the quarrel. To swim with the stream, to make the pretense of boldness and bravery when all the time you know you have the backing of conventional public opinion and mob force behind you is the cheapest of mock heroics." Unquote. Now today, when you look into the bizarre world <laughs> of male feminists, as well as the much larger group we call traditional white knights, what do you see but legions of men mindlessly at the rescue? reveling in their own expendability, glorifying what Bax called irrational justice on the behalf of any woman, even ones they don't know, no matter how miserable a specimen of humanity some women may be. And what else comes with these rote demonstrations of foolishness than an equally dehumanizing view of women as damsels? porcelain incompetence who cannot handle even imagined slights without the help of these ersatz heroes. How often do we see men leading the charge against themselves, taking aim and firing directly at their own feet and at the feet of the women they are pretending to defend? That sadly is the rule in modern society, not the exception. We've all seen it. We have even seen it in attempts to silence some of us here who speak to these issues. And by the way, just to let everybody know, the A Voice for Men Facebook page this very morning, 35,000 followers strong, was removed. We have seen it as women's rights have been replaced by women's privilege, women's advocacy by women's infantilization, women's voices by the powerless wailing of little girls and the sanctimonious preaching of their male sycophants. You have to admit that these are strange happenings in a culture supposedly driven by a patriarchy that favors and advantages men at the expense of women. The allowance of all this, the enabling of it, is modern chivalry, and it does not matter whether it's a product of feminist ideology or a miscalled sense of traditional values. Its gynocentric origins are precisely the same. To understand how this happened, we must trace this brand of chivalry and deification of women back to, it, back to its roots. Not to Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinman, and other second wave icons, not even to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and others of the first wave. Oh, and Incidentally, if you'll pardon a slight personal departure here, during my research for this talk, I discovered a first wave feminist from Sussex, the same area where I've traced my family name back to the 1500s. Wikipedia describes this woman as a militant suffragette, feminist and fascist, who was imprisoned three times for terroristic acts in Her Majesty's prison Holloway in this very city. Here's a picture of her. Her name was Nora Elam. <laughs> now, I haven't managed the courage yet to investigate a real family connection with certainty, but just in case I wanted to say here on UK soil that whatever this Harridan did, I'm happy to be a part of the movement to undo it. <laughs> now, 
<laughs> but enough of my history. <laughs> it is our history that matters, in particular, the evolution of gynocentric chivalry. Originally, chivalry was a different concept than we know it today. It was a military code of conduct upheld by the nobility and used to ensure the protection of serfs who lived and worked on their lands and more than a few times to keep them in line. It also served well to keep men already inclined to take risks and act protectively to act in the service of the church, the king, and the aristocracy. That military chivalry was the cornerstone of, of feudalism. It ensured that arms would be drawn and blood spilled by vassals on command. Those who did not abide by that code or who performed poorly in their efforts were saddled with the same type of shame and disgracing we use on men today who fail as the protectors of and providers for women. Military chivalry was a tradition rooted in the bloody realities of medieval life but it was not a romantic notion, far from it. So how did chivalry go from being military code to being a codified standard for men to meet in their protective treatment of women? The answer to that is a matter of historical record. It was through manipulation of the gynocentric instinct. In the 12th century, Eleanor of Aquitaine and her daughter Marie de Champagne engaged in an intensive campaign to popularize the idea of courtly or romantic love. By definition, this brand of love was an adulterous one in nature, and it was given a value that rose above all other morality. Even as we saw in the story of Lancelot and Guinevere, above the authority and power of a king. Keep in mind that at the time, and reaching back through recorded history, people generally held two notions of love, and both were highly impersonal. There was lust, a purely physical but largely impersonal form of love, and there was what we call agape, an elevated love, as in the love of God or the love of mankind, a sweeping spiritual form of love, but not a personal one. People recognized what we call infatuation now, of course, but it was not viewed really as love. It was seen more like a vexation or illness, a kind of craziness that only led to ruin. I suppose in some ways they were a lot smarter than we are now. <laughs> At the time, marriages were arranged, and they still are in parts of the East. Marriage was the way that families furthered their interest, both politically and financially. Husbands and wives often grew quite fond of each other over time, but they did not enter matrimony out of a desperate emotional need to be with each other. And by the way, this is not an endorsement of arranged marriage. Just going over a little history. Eleanor, a woman of serious means and influence, sort of like a supersized Betty Friedan of the high Middle Ages, saw an opportunity in this to promote a connection between men and women inspired by passion and infatuation and driven by a model of service, particularly of service to women. She and her daughter commissioned troubadours who borrowed from the ethics of military chivalry to write books and songs that carried this message to all the European courts. Even though the message was meant primarily for the aristocracy, it eventually filtered down into the general population and quickly grew in popularity till the arranged marriage in the West became a thing of the past and till the view of women as emotional toddlers in need of male guardianship and enabling became a thing of the future. This was not the first time that a social paradigm shifted drastically because of the actions of nobility. The Emperor Constantine of Rome sparked the exponential growth of a small religious sect with a series of edicts. Today we know that sect as Christianity. The Indian King Ashoka single-handedly had the same effect on Buddhism. No, that's not Sargon up there. Um, in both these cases, the actions of single, powerful people changed the way people thought and what they believed in the most radical and permanent of ways. And so did Eleanor and Marie, arguably further and even more powerful change. Matrimony, notice it is not patrimony, is a word that originally meant it was time for a woman to set aside childish desires and be ready for the responsibilities of motherhood. 
That was the standard and the expectation prior to the gynocentric model furthered, furthered by Eleanor and Marie. Their advocacy was a rebellion against the arrangement tradition. It was an amazingly effective campaign that now shapes the lives of all of us. The advent of romantic chivalrous love took the naturally occurring, occurring tendency in men to take care of women and made the first great leap toward a gynocentric society that would tolerate and indeed encourage all manner of insanity in the name of putting women first. We now have filled prisons, ruined lives, and populated graveyards with children in that pursuit all because we live in a culture that refuses to recognize that evil isn't gendered. Today, we not only embrace women-only services in our universities where men are a shrinking minority, we see active and sometimes violent opposition to services for men. We now live with a general assumption that women are incapable of violence or of lying about rape or of any sort of moral turpitude. We also have a host of other prima facie examples of outrageous gynocentrism in the name of demonizing men and reducing women to distressed, needful damsels. We have women-only train cars, women-only parking spaces, women-only social services, women-only legislation, and women-only governmental assistance to the economically disadvantaged. We used to have similarly exclusive ideas in the United States, but we called them something else. The only way we changed that was confronting the bigotry directly. The Ku Klux Klan had to be confronted for their evil, but if we failed to confront the deeper underlying racism we would have gotten nowhere. This is one problem I see in parts of our current model of anti-feminism. Without addressing the gynocentrism at feminism's core, we are simply tilting at windmills. A hundred years after Belfort Bax predicted the outcome of rampant gynocentrism, men are still sentenced to 66% more time in prison than women for the same crime and are twice as likely to be incarcerated, again, for the same crime. Men still kill themselves at three, four, or five times the rate of women depending on where you live. Men are still either mocked or ignored when they are abused in relationships. Men are falling out of education and the workplace like flies. The men who remain in education face hostile administrations, equally hostile student bodies, an absence of due process, and the constant risk of their lives becoming Kafkaesque nightmares. Men face horrific treatment and discrimination in our family courts with arrogant, abusive judges meting out unjust decisions, be they liberal or conservative. We medicate many of our young boys with potent psychotropic medications with long-term implications simply because they demonstrate the normal male rambunctiousness that becomes an inconvenience for teachers and single mothers. Men still face the sexual landscape with no reproductive rights and everything to lose. We still, especially in the U.S., routinely sexually mutilate our infant boys, killing some of them off while we do why we would not dream of visiting such savagery on our girls. There's a long list of other problems, too many for me to address here, but individually the problems themselves are not the worst of it. The big problem, the overarching evil in this situation is that we live in, live in a culture so bigoted, so insanely skewed in favor of women that merely talking about any of this is enough to get you socially and professionally ostracized and attacked savagely by Belfort Bax's mocks, mock heroes who are everywhere. I hope with all my might today, right now, that we can all pledge to end this insanity. <laughs> Thank you.
We can all easily laugh at the antics of Big Red and Triglypuff and even the hate-filled ravings of people like Julie Bindle. We can find easy entertainment in the bizarre freak show that has come to typify modern feminism. We can even enjoy, for instance, feminism's gynocentric way of telling us that 75% of the homeless population are male. <laughs> or what really constitutes homelessness that is unacceptable. If we are to ever move past that into a society willing to do anything about the staggering amount of real life problems faced by men and boys, it will only be because we aggressively challenge the gynocentrism that has always been in the way. Needless to say, we don't need to take everything from take anything from women to do that, except perhaps some outmoded privilege that is no longer helping society, but rather hurting half the people who live in it. We can oppose feminism, and well we should, but my two senses is, is that this is not nearly enough. The social change we need will take men of character and good conscience moving past mock heroics to stand up and defend their own and each other's humanity, and it will take women of the same character standing next to those men and indeed standing with them. It will also take something else equally important. It will take the older men of this generation setting a better example than we have. Part of the ill effects of gynocentrism is the pressure on men to remain silent and complicit in the face of mistreatment and injustice that is visited on our sons. With the elder males remaining mute while this happens, they have abandoned younger men to countless abuses. Anti-feminism, however great its merits, doesn't solve this. Love does. Valuing does. And courage does. The poet Robert Bly once said of older men, if you are not valuing a younger man, you're harming him. Truer words have never been spoken. One of the first casualties of gynocentrism run amok was mentoring. This happened as older men, men who could have done something, allowed the demonization and destruction of male space. The death of mentoring was more than just the death of a tradition. It was, in many ways, the death of the young man's soul. It was the final signal that he was on his own in a hostile world. So even as I came here to challenge men and women to stand on equal ground with each other and to defy the world by viewing each other with equal valuing and equal standards, I also challenge each older man within earshot of this to let a younger man in your life know he is valued and to be willing to prove it whenever necessary by standing up for him. Indeed, by standing up for all of them. Thank you. speech I think it, what, what you did in that speech is very important it's not as you say it's not just feminism it is feminism but it's also the incredibly powerful um, code of chivalry underneath that underpins men's behavior that, that is the, the cause of the problems we have today um, I'm being rather pessimistic on the phones but how hopeful are you that, that it's possible to sort of eliminate the effects of chivalry or gynocentrism as you say because the bottom line is the biology of the situation is that men are not as important as women physically speaking because they cannot give birth women do the most important job in society and uh without women there wouldn't be there wouldn't be men um that's not going to change and uh, as i see it, that that's really underpins everything so can we really ever get rid of 
um, chivalry and garment centrism? Will we ever see an end to women and children first policies, for example? Or is that just too powerful a biological instinct, do you think? I don't think we'll ever get rid of it, and I don't think that we necessarily need to. Uh, if the objective is to make human beings different than what they are by nature, then, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeless right along with you. What I have hope in is the capacity of changing narrative of this room full of people, of other rooms full of people, of creating an alternative for young men to have a place to go if they want to check out of that narrative. I heard somebody say earlier that they believed that, that Mingtao was a death wish. I disagree entirely. I think it's a life wish. Um, but I think we also need better options than that for young men. Um, this, for me, again, was never about changing the entire world. I don't think you change the nature of human beings that easily. The, the goal for A Voice for Men has all, always been, my goal is to create an avenue, a way out to a different way of thinking, a different set of pictures, a different narrative for young men who want to avail themselves of something different and an alternative for, for fathers to teach their sons other than just repeating the mistakes of the past over and over again. How far that spreads, I won't even try to play prognosticator enough to guess, but I see it already happening in the culture now. This room full of people right now could not have been imagined five years ago. It's happening now. you say something along the lines of um, changing men and changing women. And it strikes me that uh, we'll never change those because they've been, we're, our instincts have been there for millions of years, hopefully. I wasn't there at the time. Um, and that won't be changed. And that has been the means of our survival. Uh, well, what's happened is the instincts, uh, like everything else, has been hijacked by the politics. Now, we can't change the politics, unfortunately, I think, because it's just too big at the moment. Maybe it will fade out or whatever in time. Um, but I think we need to encourage the instincts of men's, men and women because that's how we so uh, successfully survive. And I just want to put, put that to you as, as, uh, as a, the, the question being, do you think that, that this is a, a reasonable way to go forward and rather than confuse it with being a, a need to change men and women? Well, I, I'm, I'm saying, asserting that we probably can't change men and women, but... I'm also asserting that our needs as a species in this wonderful air-conditioned room in a relatively safe environment are not the same as they were on the African savanna three million years ago. Uh, we live in a different existence today, and it's sort of like saying three million years ago, what I needed to survive was that if you had a piece of meat, I needed to take a rock and hit you on the head with it to, to take your piece of meat so I could survive. We, because of technology and because of law and civilization, we do rise above certain human instincts in order to govern ourselves in a better way. There's no disputing that. So saying that we need to rely on the same instincts that drove us to survival on the African savanna three million years ago, that those still apply 100% now in the same way they did then, I think sort of flies in the face of modern realities. That's, I'm sorry, that's the best answer I can give you. Hi. Um you said uh, feminism is a symptom of gynocentrism. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. I would say so, yes. Um, how would you... It certainly exploits gynocentrism in one of the most effective ways we've, we've ever seen. Sure. And um, what would you say about Black Lives Matter? Like, how does that relate? Which, did it come out of something else? <laughs> it's like, it's basically the same thing to me. 
but it's not feminism. But is it? Are, are they just getting it from the same sort of classes? And then they just apply well, what you're, one, you're talking about um, an instinctive reaction in human beings that's been exploited. Uh, part of our instinctive reactions was to enslave black people at one point. Um, whether that plays into Black Lives Matter now, I mean, we could have a long discussion on that, but I'm not seeing it. Um, uh, one's a political movement, purely and simply. Uh, and they are certainly there's a million forms of identity politics in which people get victim status by identifying by members of particular groups. Well, except for us. Um, but comparing the experience of African Americans in this case uh, to women in general, way apples and oranges. I don't think I can draw a connection. To that. Whoa. Hello, I have turned it on. Um, I, I heard what you said that uh, you think there's change happening now. Um, but one of the things that actually really does trouble me is seeing the contrast between the current generation of boys and when I was growing up. Um, I remember just the general atmosphere when I was in school was that um, we, we kind of knew what was expected of us and we had to live up to it, but otherwise we were just sort of um, ignored or abandoned by society. And we it, it, it was a bad thing, but it also gave us kind of space to be ourselves. Um, and when I look at boys today, they, they don't have that. They're not ignored. They're, you know, they're, it's almost like they're just hated these days. Um, they, they're, just, they're harangued and harassed constantly and they're, you know, they're, they're nannied. Um, so it, my question is, you know, do you think that the, the current generation of boys is going to be the one that's going to make the changes that you need? And do you think that there is hope for them or is it going to be like a, a multi-generational project? I think it has to be a multi-generational project uh, because the boys uh, alive now have simply been betrayed too much. I mean, one of the issues in mentoring and reaching young boys now is that they don't trust us. And I don't blame them. Uh, the system has ripped their fathers out of their lives. They've been sent to schools that teach them they're inferior. While what few men are there standing around say nothing or participate in the abuse. Uh, it is I mean, I'm not pretending like there is simple answers to any of this. This is going to be a, a very, very slow kind of social change. But one thing that always encourages me when I think about it, Seneca Falls, I believe, was in 1852. It was 70 years after that uh, before the 19th Amendment was passed, another 50 after that before the Gorgon of gender feminism rose its ugly head and started inflicting even more damage. Even in a species that is wired to protect women and give them what they want for the most part at all costs, these types of changes are slow. We have to look at this in the long game. And I think that mentoring, I was really encouraged by Anil Kumar's talk, uh, their community-based model, the way they were doing outreach with men and not even focusing so much around activism, but focusing on community, focusing on support in groups. Uh, that's a model that can heal people, that can uh, ameliorate some of the problems that you're talking about in, in kids that are basically being sent to be feral now because there's no masculine role models that are allowed to even participate in their lives. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to face it. I'm, I'm with Janice. I'm being bleak. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we've lost a lot of ground over a long period of time. And this we're going to have to scratch and claw our way back to bring any sense of sanity to the younger generations again. Uh, Paul, um, this is going to have to be the last question. I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, Paul, thanks for your great speech. Um, uh, in my speech, uh, I put this uh, provocally in 
intended line, uh, like the patriarchy as our enemy. Um, I think that fits well with the uh, with the concept of of Gainas and Tristan, because uh, it's pretty much something that's forced on the lower and middle class boys and men, and pretty much plays into the hands uh, of the powerful man, I think. So, what's your opinion about that? I agree with you. Um, I think that uh, uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. I think that um, women have been given a track to the middle. Um, and I don't mean that in the glass ceiling sense. I, to me, that's a bunch of hogwash. But women have been sold the bill of goods that if you abandon the concept of motherhood, if you uh, abandon the concept of commitment, if you just come to work, if you find your identity as a professional woman, that you're going to be much better off. You're going to be free. And of course, when you see them in their late 30s, early 40s, in a cubicle somewhere with bags under their eyes, exhausted, well, living like men uh, all the time, it doesn't look so good. And they find out that they're not, not all going to end up in the corner office. Um, I don't see this as a male conspiracy at the top. I think there's a lot of people profiting from it in the middle. But I think it's really been one big scam uh, to get women into being uh, twice the taxpayers, twice the workers, cheaper labor, still doing the same jobs they were all doing before, and enriching, uh, enriching a very elite class at the top. I'm sorry, I'm going to wear a tinfoil hat for a moment, but that's what I believe has happened in all this. Gentlemen, ladies, Paulina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.